Hello everyone and welcome to today's Connect and Learn webinar. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on, of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples listening today or in the future. My name is Rebecca and I will be facilitating today's webinar. The Comprehensive Continuous Integrated System of Care, its future in Victoria. This webinar is part of a series of Connect and Learn webinars designed to support AOD clinicians throughout Victoria. This webinar series is funded by the Victorian Department of Health and hosted by Turning Point. We like our webinars to be as interactive as possible, so please ask questions via the Q&A function. The questions will be collated and answered by our presenter at the end. Please be aware that our webinars are also recorded and are later made available on the Turning Point website. Uh, we will also be sharing a copy of today's slides. We encourage you to stay to the end of the webinar and complete the exit survey when the QR code appears on, a, on the final slide or via email later today when it's forwarded to you. I'd like to introduce our presenter, Patrick Lawrence. Patrick has been the CEO of First Step since 2016, where he works with a world-class multidisciplinary team that supports people with co-occurring needs. Thank you so much, Patrick, for your time. That's a pleasure. Okay, uh, Rebecca, we're, we're off and running. Um, thank you for the introduction. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're on today, and we're all on, uh, particularly a very notable time in this nation's history uh, when issues around equality of access to care and treatment and support and a lot of the values integral to the CCISC, I think, are informative uh, in relation to our current debate. Um, Rebecca mentioned that um, we like these sessions to be interactive. I can tell you I'm sitting in a very nice room at Turning Point. I've been uh, welcomed by Marion and Guido and Rebecca. And that was all very interactive. And now I'm staring at a screen. And it's very weird. I can't see another human being. I believe 300 have signed up and maybe 150 of you are there. Welcome. Hello. Um, I'm waving at you. Um, if you want, you can, you can wave back at me in a gesture that I, unfortunately I can't see. Um, to aid the connection, I won't um, give people my mobile number. That could be disruptive. Um, but if you do want to communicate um, afterwards and you've got something you might forget, I do give my email address at the end of the presentation, patrick at firststep.org.au. Uh, but feel free to, to email me during the session. Obviously, I'm not going to read them, but, you know, we can feel like the communication is flowing. Um, so I've got a, a pretty interesting task here. Um, I'm talking about something that I feel really quite passionately about um, in a period of intense change, uh, hopefully intense reform, mental health reform. Um, and I'm one of these organisations that sort of sits in AOD and mental health and other things at the same time. Are we part of the reform? Aren't we part of the reform? What's going on? Um, what about this recommendation 35 for integrated care that we've heard so much about is CCISC, which is what I'll call the Comprehensive Continuous Integrated System of Care. Is it relevant to the Royal Commission? Um, I'm going to try to answer all of those questions to the best of my ability. And please do send the questions in. Um, but uh yeah, it's tricky because so much so much is unknown. What I most want out of this webinar is for you to get a good idea of what CCISC is um, and to get sort of a feel for it. So we're even going to be doing a little bit of workshopping, even though I'm doing it with absolutely no feedback whatsoever. Um, I really want people to walk away and go, oh, okay, I, I, I get that. I get what it's about. Um, and hopefully some of you are interested and interested to go to the original website or the First Steps website to learn some more um, and to apply the principles or do a full-blown CCIC work at your workplace or at least curious to learn more. So here is lesson number one. Um, I haven't even shown you a table of contents yet, but I'm going with lesson number one. The CCIC is comprehensive. It's continuous. It's very integrated, 
but it's not a system of care. What I mean is it's not a set of rules and systems and processes that tell you how you should work with someone, uh, with your with your clients and with their family. It, it is basically a change management tool specifically cast for the purpose of changing your organisation from where, wherever you are now, and, the, and you might be in a fabulous place already, to being an organisation that is better at working with people with co-occurring needs. So it really is a change management tool, not a system. And within that change management tool, any of the things that you have learnt, any systems uh, that you put in place and AOD comprehensives and um, you know dialectic behavioural therapy, all, all those things can be used within the system. It's not a prescriptive system of care, okay? That's lesson number one. Um, I'm going to move on. I have to click on the PowerPoint and then it will listen to me when I press the button. Yes, it will. This is a lovely group of people that represents the nine organisations who were commissioned by the Department of Health uh, over, it was 15 months in the end, to trial the CCISC in a southeast Melbourne setting. Uh, we called it, and the government called it, the Integrated Care Pilot. You don't really need to remember Integrated Care Pilot, though you will see that logo that we pay 50 bucks for um, pop up every now and then. This is a session about the CCISC, but to understand it better, we'll talk about what we do with the Integrated Care Pilot. Um, hopefully heaps of people in the audience will recognise people um, on the screen there. Uh, we've got our friends from Alfred Health, Men Mental and Addiction Health, um, Gabby Cohen in the middle. I'm sure heaps of people know Gary, uh, Gabby. Um, Star Health, now Better Health Network, their drug and alcohol team. Uh, Windana and Task Force, I should call them, as they are newly amalgamated or amalgamating. Uh, Berry Street, who work with children in out-of-home care. At Access Health, the Salvation Army's on uh, Grey Street in St Kilda, which is a, a drop-in, a lot of AOD work, a lot of mental health work. Uh, Irma 365, who work primarily in the disability space. And also SEMFN, the South East Melbourne Primary Health Network, who are sort of a, a special uh, partner, a little bit different as they're not a service organisation. Um, there's a bunch of us all hanging out there. Um, and that was on our, our sort of last day, which ironically, because this ran over COVID, was the last was the first time we were all in the room together. Moving along. So the Integrated Care Pilot was a state-funded Department of Health, thank you, Department of Health, trial of the Comprehensive Continuous Integrated System of Care. Its three core principles can be described as welcome, empathy, and hope. Now, something that's ironic about me sitting in a room here, twiddling back and forth on my seat with no real life feedback, is that CCIC is all about human interaction. It's all about the ways we work together. It's about the nature of those relationships being open and caring and supportive, um, the way we work with our clients, the way we work with each other, the way we work across management boards and everything else. And that is embodied by the founders of CCIC who are... Um, on my left, Dr. Ken Minkoff, on my right, Dr. Chris Klein. They are partners in life and they're also Zia Partners, the website. You'll find later or just Google Zia Partners. They are both psychiatrists, um, but they are the warmest, least clinical, most um, let's all get together and work at this psychiatrist that you'll ever meet in your life. I wanted to include a picture of them because their smiley faces really do embody what CCISC is all about. Okay, so I'm already several minutes in and we're doing table of contents. We're going to do a bit of history. We're going to uh, bring in the voice of lived and lived experience to this group because it is essential to CCISC in the form of quotes from clients of our nine services. Uh, I'm going to talk about how the CCISC fits in our current landscape to some extent. Uh, CCS, uh, IS, CCISC, the basics. The CCISC self-evaluation, which is really the most sort of notable and critical tool at the core of what CCISC is, and action plans. And action plans is where the action happens. Uh, we're going to talk about our learnings and findings as the integrated care pilot, what we learned about each other, what we learned about ourselves, what we learned about CCISC. And we had an independent evaluation was part of this integrated care pilot from LDC group. And I'll include some of their official findings about CCIC. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what's next for CCIC. I'll give you a spoiler is we don't know what's next. Um, yes, everyone can do some work with it. That's great. 
Um, but there's plenty that we don't know. So moving on, any objections? Can I move on? Great, no objections. Sorry, I'm entertaining myself with no one else. Um, I'm going to give you some words here, and I want you to think about where they might have come from. I'm calling it previous insights. There is a strong body of evidence which supports the view that a more integrated approach to service provision for people with dual diagnosis, so obviously diagnoses or um, seeking support for mental health and alcohol and other drug use, Service provision for people with dual diagnosis will not only improve outcomes for those affected, but will be more efficient and cost effective. So this notion that dual diagnosis, looking at both of these needs simultaneously, preferably in one or in one place by one organisation, will be more efficient and cost effective. That idea has been around for some time. I'm sure there are plenty of colleagues in the room that can probably tell me the first seven times it appeared in different official documents in Australia. From the same place, governments appear to have difficulty engaging with the realities of dual diagnosis. That's a truism. The evidence clearly indicates that it is counterproductive to separate out mental health and drug and alcohol services in such a definite way. Okay, interesting. The thoughts are getting a little bit more sophisticated. Where do these come from? Put your hands up if you think Royal Commission. Yeah, it's a trap. It's a trap. This is from the Senate, the, the Parliament of Australia's Senate Select Committee on Mental Health. Uh, the report was tabled in April of 2006. When you get the PDF, if you want to follow it up, um, you can go through to Chapter 14 of that Select Committee's final report. Dual diagnosis, the expectation, not the exception, right? So never were truer words spoken. This is a, actually a core principle of CCISC that we assume that everyone will have co-occurring needs and we do our best to meet them all. Uh, so CCIC refers to, you'll see this phrase a lot, complex co-occurring needs. I think it is now self-explanatory in this context. And it means just that. With CCIC, it's not limited to alcohol and other drugs slash addiction and mental health, mental illness, mental distress, though these feature heavily. It is not specifically limited to those two things. Um, some more insights from the same document because they are just so good. In its submission, Eastern Hume Dual Diagnosis Service warned that specialisation of skills in a third tier specialist dual diagnosis service, providing treatment only for those with co-occurring disorders may exacerbate rather than alleviate the likelihood of these individuals falling through the gaps. The reason for this is that access to appropriate treatment relies on staff being adequately trained to identify and assess complex disorders, which they would not be inclined to do if dual diagnosis is regarded as the domain of specialists. Now, I'm not saying dual diagnosis shouldn't be the domain of specialists, but I am saying it should be the domain of all of us to some extent, and that is also a core principle of CCISC. And finally, from that document, discussions with Connections staff. Connections is uh, Jesuit Social Services Youth uh, dual diagnosis around the impact of dual diagnosis teams in Victoria considered on the negative side that the problem of staff in each sector not wanting to work with dually diagnosed clients persists. So this is from 2006. We hope there's been progress, but we really need to understand and acknowledge that there is significant cultural shift that needs to happen. It's probably a lot healthier in the AOD sector. I think generally we're used to dealing with everything we can with limited resources, um, but a big part of this piece is culture. People have to want to do the work and have to believe that people we want to work with um, are worthy of the resources that we should be giving to them, providing them with. Great. And then there was a Royal Commission. So doubtless I will touch on the Royal Commission here and there, but uh, this is the Royal Commission, obviously, into Victoria's mental health system. It had a whole lot of recommendations. Uh, recommendation 35 is for integrated care. It relates particularly closely to CCISC, and I'll probably touch on the Royal Commission um, several more times in the presentation, just spontaneously. I want to use the words of some clients and carers. Now, when the integrated care pilot, those nine organisations, did the, the our um, trial of the CCISC, a couple of points. We've got a whole lot of clients of our various services together and carers of those clients, and we asked them uh, their experience of the AOD and mental health sectors. 
Now, nothing I'm going to write up here, uh, put up here, is organisation specific. It may have may not have even been any of those known organisations. They might have been talking about experience they had somewhere else, but they were very interesting reflections. And it's important to bring that perspective here today. I've called this bit when the sector sucks. Astounded at how siloed services were, often told that a worker could not work could work on one issue but not on this other issue. This is relatively recent. Like we did this a year ago, yeah? I've spent 10 years in the wilderness feeling excluded, trying desperately to find the right support. In case it's not obvious, these are all different people saying these things. For my son, experience has been very dependent on the quality of the worker. It's been a really traumatising experience. It was a disaster. I ended up overwhelmed with too much on my plate, having to go to all of these different places and getting a shopping list of diagnoses. Nurses were really nice, but the system is so broken. It was like you were an animal. That bit hurts, doesn't it? By the time my daughter builds rapport, they are exiting her. And I know you've all heard these stories many times. No one listened, not to me, not to my wife. Now, our sector, uh, and by that I'm going to say AOD and mental health, uh, doesn't only suck. Quite often, it rocks. And these were quotes about that. The workers let me drive my own bus, waited for me to be ready, were really patient. So we're talking about agency, we're talking about strength-based, we're talking about um, uh, stages of change and what, what CCIC calls stage-matched interventions. I felt accepted there. There was kindness and respect. They really listened and treated me like a human being. Understanding, supportive, flexible. She accepted me for who I was. Well, good on her, whoever she is. It was all about the quality of connection. I was being educated, not excluded. I knew what was happening. We had people who listened to us, both the person using and my family. We live with it every day. We are treated like we're experts in our own lives. And despite the F-ups, we are experts. Great, eloquent quotes about what goes wrong and what goes right. And CCIC is all about recognising the work that's been done well and celebrating it and seeing where there can be improvements. I've got no idea what the next slide is. Oh, okay. So um, integrated care is, uh, there are a lot of different definitions. Now, I am HO, in my honest opinion, I just felt the need to put on paper what I think integrated care is and what it needs to exist in very broad brushstrokes. Integrated care exists when, in a welcoming and hope-filled environment, people with co-occurring needs get all the help they want and need from one team. Now, in case you can't see the screen or it's too small, the team is in quotes. There are different ways for there to be one team. It doesn't have to be one site. It can be two organisations on one site in Recommendation 35 of the Government, of uh, the Royal Commission. There are different models but it needs to feel like one team. I would say that that feeling is easier to create when you have multiple disciplines on one side, but that's my bias. For this to happen, these individuals and their families need, one, they need governments to facilitate and mandate integrated care through guidelines, contracts, and other means. They need funding bodies, including the uh, soon to be birthed regional mental health boards, which facilitate and mandate integrated care. We need organisations that have the right ethos, the structure, the staffing, collaborative frameworks for integrated care. We need staff that have the skills, support and environment for integrated care and staff who have the desire to both serve and collaborate with people seeking help for co-occurring needs and are supported to do so. So the staff are supported to do so. I feel like this is sort of the key five things that need to be in place. I mention them here because how does CCISC fit within that? So it's important to pause for a moment and think about the system that we have in place, the many, many systems, the many organisations, and we can't say, oh, here are some great principles, let's start from scratch. That's impossible. All we can do is change and hopefully change in the right direction. 
We can't build our system or organisation from scratch, so we must transform them, recognising what each part does well and building on it. Let's do that, aiming for enhanced impact through intersectional practice. Now, I have a bucket list, and there are two phrases on it, and this is one of them, enhanced impact through intersectional practice. If someone could one day quote that back to me, but don't tell me that they first heard it from me, um, that'd be great, and then I can then I can die happy. What I mean here, uh, and it's certainly not my concept, it's just perhaps my wording, is that if we do good, let's just take AOD and mental health. If we provide integrated AOD and mental health care uh, through a, a good system and a good organisation, we're going to be doing each of those components better. It is their very intersectionality, is the fact that they coexist that means if we do what's needed to address multiple needs, we'll address each of those needs better. That's the enhanced impact through intersectional practice. I hope that makes sense. Tell me someone's writing it down. Okay, CCISC asks, what would a service look like that is achieving all of the above? And by all of the above, I mean, oops, my numbers are wrong, sorry. I mean, sections three, four, and five from the previous slide. Organisations with the right blah, 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 staff with the skills and support and environment, staff who have the desire and are supported to care for people with co-occurring needs. So that's a pretty long introduction, and now we're going to get a little bit into it. Ah, 80 to, 80 to 100%. So with our nine organisations, we did a number of different audits of our organisations on different days to find out how, what percentage of our clients we thought had AOD and mental health needs, and it varied between 80 and 100%. That might not be the same everywhere. Point being, there are more people with co-occurring needs than without them, and it should be the assumption. Okay. The big picture. These are some of the core principles of CCISC. You will recognise all of them. Fantastic. Great. So the CCIC is not some alien beast with all uh, different words that we've never heard before. Person-centred. Clients and family at the centre of care and involved in organisational change. That second point is crucial. Integrated. What does it mean here? Multidisciplinary staff teams, it can be across organisations, collaborate with each other and the client to plan and implement care and support. Co-occurring capable. So this particular bit of, let's call it jargon, um, is a CCIC phrase you might not have heard before. This refers to when you have staff and systems and policies that are designed so that they can operate with the expectation of co-occurring needs. So it's not you're doing AOD with someone and you just go, oh, oh heavens, there's some mental health needs. Who can we get to help with that? That's kind of the opposite of co-occurring capable, co -occurring capable is when you look for those needs at the start, you assess appropriately, you triage, you have the right team around, you know what questions to ask you, yourself are skilled in multiple areas, et cetera, et cetera. It's co-occurring capable. We'll go into that in a lot more detail. Strength-based. Planning and treatment draws on strengths and past successes and focuses on clients' desired outcomes, not just about stabilising and referring. That last bit, of course, we call recovery-based or recovery-focused. Not, not new concepts there, I don't think. So what we need, we need culture and policies, staff skills, data systems and practices exist to realise a vision of welcome, empathy and hope. Super. Moving on. How's my time? Okay. So CCISC, CCISC the basics. There are... <clears throat> Five elements to CCIC. Now, in, I think you will be sent out this. Oh, great. It's all white. <laughs> That's not working. It's a big A3 um, spreadsheet uh, called the CCIC schematic that actually I put together uh, with the blessing and approval of Ken and Chris um, in Arizona. Um, and it outlines all the, the, the core um, elements of CCIC. So you can sort of see it at a glance. In the, one of the last slides, there's a link to First Step's website that has uh, that has this schematic. Um, if you want to go there now, www.firststep.org.au forward slash ICP. You can click on the logo and have a look at the spreadsheet. You don't need to, but you can if you want. 
So it has key elements, it has principles, it has steps, it has the self-assessment that I talked about. There are 68 questions on the self-assessment and it has action plans. But in fact, the action plans are very much built by uh, the teams doing CCISC. I'm going to give you some examples of each of these things to get an idea of what a key element is. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of each of these things because it's too much, but two or three elements, two or three principles, so you get the vibe. Key elements. The CCIC engages staff across your whole organisation, top to bottom, including clients and carers, is what I mean by C and C there. So this is absolutely all about teamwork, which, of course, our care should be also about treatment, uh, care teamwork. It involves integrating best practice into all core processes. So you don't just need staff who are trained in how to do something. You need staff who are supported to be trained, who are supported to do that work. When someone uh, comes in for specific service and needs something else, they need the team around them. They need the funding to build that team around them. Yeah? Best practice has to be integrated into all core processes. Every change gets anchored in operational infrastructure, including policies. So when you do CCIC right, yes, it does involve changing a lot of your documentation, uh, which becomes part of your induction and, and ongoing training, which hopefully makes it permanent. We consolidate the changes. Here are three of the principles. Co-occurring conditions are an expectation, not an exception. Already already touched on that. It has huge ramifications when you take it through to its logical conclusion. The foundation of integrated care is a welcoming, empathetic, strength-based relationship. So nothing takes away from the fact that anyone you're working with needs to trust you and believe that there is some kind of connection that you care about them and that you are there to help them. If that is not in place, forget about it. Skill-based learning is central. And the skill-based learning here, um, I probably should put something in brackets, um, they're talking about clients. So clients aren't just given treatment and medication and whatnot. They are taught how to live healthier lives. Uh, there are a few different steps. Uh, one of the key ones is the steps to, there happen to be 12 of them, uh, co-occurring capability. Again, this is on the spreadsheet. These are the first three steps. So this is something that we all went through with the Integrated Care Pilot, a formal announcement and commitments, and uh, that is uh, to say to the world, we are becoming a co-occurring capable organisation, or however you want to say it. We will be welcoming clients with complex and co-occurring needs, these kind of statements, and they, will, they need to appear on websites and social media, in your policies, on your building, so people know that they're welcome there. Create whole of organisation, continuous quality improvement teams. And really, actually, if you were to boil CCIC down to one thing, this is actually it. It is all about continuous quality improvement that's guided through the CCIC process. Step three, identify change agents from frontline staff. So, I mean, that is their wording, but really you do need change agents across the organisation. You need someone in the board who believes in it. You need someone in senior management. You need someone in all of your teams. Um, and they're the folks that keep the ball rolling. The enthusiasm needs to be organisation-wide. It's about keeping the ball rolling. So then the there are a number of different kinds of um self-assessment questions. The, the popular one, the one that most people use, has the name of Compass EZ, as in the letters E and Z. Um, that's what Ken and Chris call it, Compass EZ. I'm just going to call it Compass. Here is one of the self-assessment questions, but we're actually going to have a look at a bunch of them. Written program des descriptions specifically say that individuals and families with complex and co-occurring issues are welcomed for care. So when you're doing the self-assessment, you rate yourself out of five on that question. One, nah, program descriptions don't mention anything about that. Five, yep, yeah, we're all over it, yeah? And action plans. So after doing the self-assessment process, it is about celebrating where you're doing well, looking at where you're not doing as well and thinking which of these things do we want to change. In fact, there's no you know, mandated to turn a one into a three or anything like that. It's about 
what has the self-evaluation highlighted and what do we want to work on? And this becomes part, as I said before, of your organization-wide continuous quality improvement processes. Super duper. I don't know. Maybe that looks like a lot. I, I try I try to explain it fairly simply, but it can be as big or as small as you want it to be. But you could literally walk away at two o'clock today and go to go to a meeting and say, let's do some of this CCIC stuff just for fun. I got some ideas from Patrick. Yeah. CCIC does not dictate. I talked about this before. You can use Nexus tools, you can use DBT, comprehensive AOD, um, emotional freedom technique. It's agnostic about those things. It's about how they're applied and how organisations are supported. Action plans are entirely bespoke. I think I've touched on that already. Most of the content and the drive and the ideas that come out of those action plans are from the staff. The system is the triggers and the, well, the framework and the questions themselves are the triggers. CCRC can simply be the guiding light of existing CQI systems. That's the simplest way to put it. So what we did in the integrated care pilot, we engaged senior management and executives across nine organisations. That was tricky and some of them changed during the journey. We made formal announcements of intent. We identified change champions in each of our organisations and other key staff. So you don't have to do this across organisations. In fact, it made it quite a lot complicated, more complicated and harder, but this is how we did it. We held monthly meetings of different interagency project teams. There were change agent meetings, there were um, executive meetings. We undertook self-evaluations in different ways in different organisations. Some people did homogenous teams, like all the mental health staff. Some people did uh, cross-disciplinary teams. We developed and implemented action plans within each organisation. We followed them up individually. We came back in groups and said, oh, we've changed this, we've changed that. There was much communication with and training and support from doctors, Minkoff and Klein throughout. So these guys are very accessible. If you work with an organisation that wanted to do some of this work and you wanted to get in touch with them, um, that's absolutely doable. Collaboration throughout with the evaluators. Again, LDC group who attended many, many meetings, conducted many interviews, assessed the Compass Easy tool and our change plans. So let's have a look at Compass. There are 15 different sections in the Compass and I've got a couple of questions I've highlighted. Um, that I would actually like you guys to think about. This is a lot more fun when we're in a room together and we're sitting at breakout tables, but I am going to try and give you enough time to at least think about them. Maybe we'll do the first few and then we might skip over a bit. So thinking about the program you work in or if it's an organisation, a smaller organisation, maybe the whole organisation, whatever feels natural to you, say this statement out loud. Well, I mean, I'll say it out loud. Let's see how we go. The program or organisation operates under a, vi a written vision, mission or goal statement that officially communicates to all staff and stakeholders the agency-wide goal of all its programs becoming welcoming, recovery-oriented and complexity co-occurring capable. Now, this is a typical compass question. It's quite long and it's got a few elements. We break it down. Do you have official writing that people read, both external stakeholders and staff, that says we are going to be as welcoming as we can, we're going to be recovery oriented, as in not just about fixing illnesses, but it's about working towards better futures and good at working with people with co-occurring needs. Does it say that somewhere, that that's a goal of the organisation? Have a think. If you have a writing implement near you, I do. I'm going to write down what I think my organisation, first step, there we go, there's a plug. What we're going to give us for that. So imagine if you're doing the CCIC, you're doing this in the team, it might be six, it might be 10 people. There is a rule with CCIC, the lowest score wins. So if someone in your group thinks that your organisation should get a two and everyone else thinks they should get a four, sorry, you document a two. Question number two, written program descriptions specifically say that individuals and families with complex co-occurring issues are welcomed for care. So in the documentation that you use within your organisation to describe what, let's say, your um, mental health integrated complex care team does or what your AOD program does, does it say within that documentation that you will 
work with individuals and families with complex co-occurring issues. Give yourself a mark. Give you a couple of seconds. You might say, I'm in IT, I don't know, and that's fine. If questions are not relevant, they're not really. Um, I'm going to give first step a score out of that. Of course, I've scored these before. What are you talking about? But I'm doing it again just to get the timing right. So once you've done that, this is what the actual definitions of those scores. Not at all, slightly, somewhat, mostly, completely. Now, if you gave your organisation or your program a five on any of these measures, fantastic. Celebrate literally celebrate this is something that at the conclusion of doing the compass and for most of our organizations it took about three hours and most people had three goes at it so they did an hour one week an hour next week and the week after that and it, it needs time and, it, and some of the questions lead to half an hour discussion yeah so it can be very stimulating you've got a five celebrate be happy be be gloriously happy about it you will not get 68 fives yeah, so celebrate the wins when you can get them. Um, and if you get anything less than that, then once you've gone through the questions, you'll consider, will this form part of our action plan? Now, I just copied this off the internet. This is not a CCIC document. The contents is meaningless. That's what an action plan looks like, right? It's got where we are now, where we're going to, who's responsible for it, what's the timeline, what's our most recent review. Super. Let's go on to the next section. Program policies. Program billing instructions support delivery of integrated approaches within each billing event. Now, if you don't bill, uh, replace for billing here um, just your documentation of what happened in the session, what work was completed. Does it allow for integrated approaches? So, you might be paid to do AOD work and you end up spending half the session on mental health issues for which you weren't necessarily trained, but you kind of had to because that's kind of what the client needs. Does your system allow you to record that and record how meaningful it is? It's a big question. This is an example of a question where the, if you score low, uh, there may not be an obvious next path or an answer, right? Give it a score. Next question. Clinical record keeping policies support documentation of integrated attention to mental health, health, substance use issues, and substance use issues in a single progress note and in a single client chart or record. Can you record all those areas in a sensible way that's clearly visible to the next person who should be seeing it? Yeah? Give yourself a mark. We'll keep going. Quality improvement of data. The program has a culture of empowered partnership in which leadership, supervisors, representative frontline staff, clinical and support staff, and consumers and families work together to design and implement a vision of recovery-oriented, complexity-capable services. So another one of those big senses, but do staff work with clients and family towards this vision that you're recreating for the organisation? Do you have a lived and living experience reference group? Do you have a client consulting group? Does that work happen at your organisation? Give yourself a score. The program has a continuous quality improvement team with representation from leadership, supervisors, frontline staff and consumer and families that meets regularly and uses a written plan to guide, track and celebrate progress towards being recovery oriented and complexity capable. So some of these terms you've heard a bunch of times now and it's probably getting easier to understand the whole sentences. Have you got a CQI team that meets regularly towards these goals? It's similar to the previous question and some of them are like that. Access. The program has no wrong door access policies and procedures that emphasise welcoming and engaging all individuals and families with complex co-occurring issues from the moment of initial contact. So I think everyone knows what that means. And we know we hear the term no longer a lot. Is it embedded in your policies and in your procedures that it actually functions as a no wrong door? Individuals, give yourself a mark out of five. Individuals and families 
receiving welcoming access to appropriate service regardless of active substance use. This is really important. I feel I read it poorly. Individuals and families receive welcoming access to appropriate service regardless of active substance use, whether that be blood alcohol level, urine toxicology screen, length of sobriety that they might um, testify to, or commitment to maintain sobriety. So none of our services, particularly in mental health, should be able to say, you're drunk, you're stoned, what's that effect? I can't work with you. This is no longer good enough. So this is the staff asking themselves, is this how it works? This is just a self-assessment question. It's not, is it written in policy? Is this how it works? I've got one more lot of questions, I think. Uh, screening and identification, two more lots of questions. The program screening policy states that all individuals are to be screened in a welcoming and respectful manner for complex co-occurring mental health issues, including trauma, substance use issues, medical issues, and basic social needs, and for immediate risk concerns in other areas. Now, it's pretty obvious to note that if you have none of the services that can support any of those needs bar the one narrow one that you're funded for, your inclination to ask those questions is not great. Do you need help with legal needs? Yeah, do, sorry, we're patronising. Obviously, we don't, we're don't. we not patronising that. Have you got any legal issues that you need help with? You do. Oh, um, here's the number for legal aid, right? But if you have a community legal centre on site, you're more likely to ask those questions. So it's a, quite an involved question, really. The program uses screening processes, checklists and or tools for each complex co-occurring issue that are appropriately matched to the population being screened, right? So this is where you do have your, you might use your AOD comprehensive. Again, the organisation with the community legal centre has to have its, community, its legal screening questions. You need tools that are appropriate to find out what is going on in the life of that client. Those tools need to be accessible. They need to be understood by anyone doing any kind of intake or first interview. Score out of five. Last one. Assessments document individual and or family goals for a hopeful, meaningful and happy life using the person's or family's own words. Score out of five. Do you write down what your clients or your families want for a better future in their words? The assessment identifies and elaborates on specific time period of recent strength or stability and skills and supports the individual or family used in order to do relatively well during that time. So this is what strength-based is about, right? And not only are you, do you have a strength-based perspective, you actually document it. When were things going well and you're writing this down? What is it that we can draw on uh, to help you in your current situation? Okay, that's all the scores from one to five we're gonna do now. Have a look over them. Maybe uh, after the session, you might have a couple of ideas you want to run away and do, maybe. There are several other chapters. Integrated person-centered planning, integrated treatment recovery, planning, relationships. That means the relationships with staff in the organisation, program policies, psychopharmacology, integrated discharge transition planning. You might be surprised to know that they believe that discharge planning should begin from first assessment. Program collaboration and partnership general staff competencies and specific staff competencies. Specific there means specific for specific groups. Uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, um, intellectual impairment. I don't mean to compare a disability with an ethnicity, apologies there, uh, but specific competencies for specific groups. That's the compass. Action plans, okay? Now I'm going to go fairly quickly because it's really obvious, but these are just examples of some of the actions that the Integrated Care Pilot came up with. Changes to public messaging, changes to internal messaging, improvements to public areas, posters, appearance, increasing internal collaboration and information sharing, changing the structures and frequency of meetings, providing focus and empowerment to existing CQI teams and changing the membership of them. Changes to templates, guidance to formalise or improve practice. For example, greater consistency of recording and clinical notes. Revamped training calendars. Changes to policies and procedures. Organisations sought training specific to trauma-informed care. Some recognise that as a bit of a gap. Substance use and addiction competencies. Identification of improvements to governance, leadership, structures and meetings. A lot of changes. So 
our learnings and findings. First of all, about the integrated care pilot itself. So at 12 months, the stretch to 15, it was too short. The If you read the LDC's report, it'll tell you that they couldn't conclusively, through quantitative data, determine that CCIC had made organisations better. Um, and that's just the way of things. But they said an awful lot of positive things about it. Participating in meetings was helpful, affirming, energising for participants. I hope you're finding this not totally unenergizing. Consistent progress was hampered by regular staff changes in COVID. Yeah, we've all heard that. Uh, applying CCIC simultaneously across a network took a lot of coordination. That's not what we're recommending that other organisations do. Um, what we learned about us, we learned that we all do co-occurring integrated work, but it is very often invisible, and meaning invisible to funders, invisible in the documentation, it's unsupported, it's unsystematised, it's not prioritised, and it's not informed by lived and living experience. But we all do it to different degrees. Much of our most important work is not documented because it's just co-occurring stuff. We gravitate, all of us, to our teams. So peers and clients need to be part of those teams, not their own teams. Overhaul of funding structures away from siloed Episodic care is urgently needed. Big surprise. Someone here is going like that. Duh. The Department of Health mirrors sector silos. The pilot was driven by departments, uh, AOD and mental health workforce team, without necessarily understanding or buying from other areas. This, this is the way life works. We are all siloed. And so we need to work on breaking down those silos together and together with the department for those of us who are department funded, which interestingly, first step is no longer. But anyway, um, our findings about us, more crucially important concepts like welcome and hope are often absent at all levels of planning. Yes, they live within individuals, within clinical and non-clinical staff. But do we talk about them in our planning? What's good for clients is good for workers. If the sector isn't co-occurring capable, we will lose people to non-treatment and to harm and, of course, to death. Language is crucial and must always be a focus in speaking with and about clients in documents, in websites, etc. I'm sure you all know that. What do we learn about the CCIC? It is consistent with the Royal Commission recommendations, pretty much all of them. I haven't got time to go into it now. Productivity Commission, the National Productivity Commission Inquiry into Mental Health, uh, I think it was two years earlier. It's absolutely consistent with those recommendations as well. The statewide service for people with co-occurring substance use or addiction and mental health, the Hamilton Centre, um, obviously is still evolving, um, uh, but CCIC does seem to line up very neatly with what the Hamilton Centre is hoping to achieve, speci specifically in that work that it intends to do with organisations, making them more capable of doing the integrated care. The Department of Health's integrated treatment guidelines. So I was lucky enough to get a draft of these guidelines um, for feedback, and I can tell you that they have used a lot of CCIC principles. It's referenced seven, several times in the document. This is about recommendation 35 for integrated care across mental health and AOD organisations. What's the time? Okay, I intend to stop pretty darn soon. Uh, learnings about CCIC. It provides shared language, values, and principles, and a framework. It can reshape existing CQI teams. It's appropriate and adaptable for all kinds of organisations. In our group, Berry Street, we're using it. They work with children out of home care. But you've seen what the questions are like. You can imagine that those same questions apply just as much to children and also in a non political setting. You can say, okay, well, we're not going to have GPs at Berry, at Berry Street or we're not going to have clinical AOD. What will you have? How will you connect? with organisations so that the kids and their families can feel like it's one team looking after them. The Compass provided a wealth of insights and laid groundwork for action plans. Some of the Compass questions are confusing and long-winded. You've seen a little bit of that yourselves. There's a lot to them. Perhaps that can be done better. CCI says a unique opportunity for whole of organisation transformation. Chris and Ken are amazing resources. I'll be uh, telling them how we went today, giving them the feedback, give me nice feedback so I can tell them that uh, you all said I did nicely. Um, we learnt what truly integrated care is. It's a masterclass in that. Well, a masterclass, of course. We learnt how to create client and worker-driven change. 
We learn how to develop cross-sectoral skills and understanding. The more multidisciplined your team, the more you will learn from each other. We learn how to move from jargonistic ideals, okay, person-centred. What does it actually mean? CCRC has questions. And if, you're anti, if you score yourself low on those questions about what being person-centred is, that means you're not person-centred. It's not something you can just say. We're person-centred. Yeah? How to deliver stage-matched approach to co-occurring needs? I didn't talk about this much, but it's a, another core CCIC principle. But once you've determined the different areas of need, and of course they change, you need an intervention in each of those areas matched to the individual stage of change. So you might consider that their mental health needs are greater than their AOD needs, but they just want help with AOD needs. They want some harm in. You give them that harm in, yeah? And they may develop a trusting relationship and within your organisation and look to support with their mental health. Where you give people what they want when they want it. Uh, just a little plug for LDC Group. They were fabulous partners. You can Google them, obviously. They do work always with uh, vulnerable communities and uh, combating disadvantage. They were our evaluators. And they had some findings, 151. Okay, I've got just a couple of slides. This is their, these are a direct excerpts out of the very lengthy report that I can't give it to you because the government hasn't released it, unfortunately. CCI says the potential to improve integrated care widely across the system as reflected in benefits observed, and there's a, a quote there, you can read this afterwards, provided an encouraging and shared language around all these wonderful principles raised awareness about what to look for when reviewing practices to identify and develop improvements towards integrated responses. That's basically what we need, right? We already have a good idea of where organisations need to go. CCIC focuses that. It raises awareness at all levels of the organisation, from front desk staff to clinical, non-clinical staff, executive, board, everyone. It affirmed workers' instincts and experience and reinforced strongly held values regarding the importance of better integrated care between AOD and mental health services particularly. Yes, it did. Um, there are some more findings. I'm going to skip over them. They're all encouraging. And I want to talk a little bit about next steps. So it recommended. The, uh, the evaluation identified that the current separation of state government structures and management for mental health and AOD funded services perpetuates fragmentation and hinders the provision of co-occurring capable care. It is therefore recommended that we are not saying AOD and mental health should be uh, the one structure, but we are saying if they're separate, there's a lot you have to do so that they work together because human beings aren't separate, are not separate. Government departments consider how AOD and mental health service structures, funding, reporting, and performance measures can be integrated, just like CCIC works to integrate organisations. The values of CCIC for addressing Royal Commission recommendations. Consider the importance of systematised and documented approach for providing integrated stage patch care. The guidelines I mentioned earlier are a, a good step in the direction of that. Changes to client management systems, hello, more flexible funding models, hello, hello. Also, in developing a Victorian-based iteration of the CCIC with some localised language and a few uh, a few relevant changes around cultural safety is strongly recommended. VADA's interested in this work. Doctors Minkoff and Klein are very supportive of the work as well. And be brought deeper into the 21st century with the interactive online website, implementation framework and toolkit, Find an expert function, discussion forums, videos, training materials, fact sheets and tools, evaluation framework and materials, taking all the essence of CCIC into an easy modern format. Develop a community of practice. We've heard of them. We're in one right now. And find a formal home. So there are some organisations that are being created around the Royal, uh, Royal Commission reforms that might be suitable places for the CCIC to live and be supported. For now, here you go. You can get to ziapartners.com. You can contact me, Patrick, at firststep.org.au. Jen Thompson is a fabulous consultant who did a lot of work with a lot of organisations doing this stuff, including each. Um, and Jen, J-E-N, at Thompson Consulting, with a P, thompsonconsulting.com. Doctors Minkoff and Klein can be contacted through their website. There is a community out there. You're potentially sitting in it. Thank you. This is a little look at the PDF, and I'm going to finish with the whole five minutes to spare. 
in the PDF you get, there are also links to a lot of evidence um, around the use of CCRC primarily in the States. And I, that's the slide I've been told to finish on. So, Rebecca, there we go. I went a little bit longer than I thought, but I'm still I'm still on time, I think. Thank you so much, Patrick. I do have a couple of questions for you to end with. Um, is uh, the CCISC under copyright? Do organisations who implement the model have to pay for it? <laughs> That's a fabulous question. Um, and the answer is maybe sort of kind of. Okay. So we are actually the Victorian model that I uh, mentioned to you. Um, we are looking at um, paying a one-off service fee to make off a client and I suppose that would be in confidence, it's not much money at all, at mm -hmm. which point it would be freely available for the whole of Victoria for the, till the end of time. So at the moment, if you were to approach them and say, look, we want to do X, Y, Z, um, you may get a bill, and they may, uh, but they may say they really want it widespread. I mean, you won't get a bill afterwards. Have a conversation with them. Um, when we did the integrated care pilot, they were paid for their time. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't paid a licensing fee for that particular project. Thank you. Uh, somewhere between zero and something. Thank you. Um, uh, this is from another person. My frontline experience is communities, workers want to support consumers, but barriers are inadequate staffing and workloads that put staff at risk of burnout. How can the sector work together to address the gap in worker-centred program development? Yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure I can answer it now. Um, I know that um, questions of workforce and budget are enormous in the minds of the department. I mean, the AOD expert advisory group. Um, one thing that I think is very important is that we continue to advocate for not just the independence, but the strength of the AOD sector. Um, I think I will just say, in my personal experience, I think there's great merit in multidisciplinary teams. And if I had money to spend on five people, for instance, I would spend them on, on uh, multi-transdisciplinary teams. I think it is a fabulous way to work. Um, communities of practice are very important. Um, hopefully in the not too distant future, CCIC will have one of them across Victoria as well. Sorry, it's a bit of a non-answer. <laughs> No, thank you, Patrick. And um, just one more to end on. Can you um, talk a little bit uh, about the synergies um, between the CCISC and the Royal Commission? Um, yeah, certainly. Um, so I, I, I spoke about um, uh, Principle 35, Recommendation 35 around integrated care, and that's where it most obviously applies. I think probably the other really important thing to note is to me there is the vibe of the Royal Commission. It's one of the things that I'm most worried about. And I think the vibe of the Royal Commission is for um, particularly mental health services to, if I can put it this way, be a little bit more like AOD services, be a bit less clinical, be a little bit more holistic, um, not be quite as risk obsessed, though I completely understand what that is about from the perspective of hospitals, et cetera. But the notion that we keep talking to our uh, clients, uh, build our organisations with lived and living experience and take a generous whole person approach to the way we go about our business, I think that's actually the vibe of the Royal Commission. It's absolutely the vibe of CCIC. I could go through several other um, specific recommendations where it lines up but it probably appears to some extent in just about all of them. Yeah. Thank you so much, Patrick. I'm just aware of the time. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for everyone um, for joining. Please do fill out um, the survey. We really appreciate it. And uh, see you all next time. Thanks, everyone.